So I have to apologize because the handout's different, but I'm happy to answer any questions about the handout because those are also my slides. So I, the problem I had was trying to define the GI tract, and there's the luminal GI tract and the pancreas, and so I decided not to include the pancreas in the GI tract in this talk, so that's why those other slides were excluded. And I wanted to focus on the luminal GI tract because these are the true original carcinoid tumors, and they're probably a little more confusing and common, and they may be more relevant to the audience. And so they can occur in any part of the GI tract. In the appendix, it's pretty common, one in 300 appendectomies. They most commonly occur in a small bowel, which is the distal small bowel, the ileum. They can occur in the rectum, the colon, the stomach, and the duodenum. So I wanted to focus, because the title of my talk was supposed to be GI neuroendocrine tumors. So first of all, if we look at the appendix, it's important to know that in one in 200 to 300 appendectomies, there will be a small carcinoid tumor. And this usually happens in young adults. And I've been called by many surgeons who are mortified and terrified because they took out what appeared to be just a standard appendicitis, and in the appendix was a small tumor. And so the question is what to do about these tumors. And I think the best data comes from Mortel at the Mayo Clinic, which was published many years ago but still holds up to today, that these tumors are actually relatively benign and indolent, and they don't need a very aggressive approach. In fact, if the tumor is less than two centimeters in size, all you need to do is an appendectomy. Now, if it's greater than two centimeters in size, two to three centimeters, or greater than three centimeters, then you need to do a right hemicolectomy. So the recommendations for these tumors, that means you need to remove the colon. Uh, if they're small, less than two centimeters, then you really just need to do an appendectomy. And that's the great majority of these patients. And these patients are usually uh, cured with just a simple appendectomy. What about small bowel carcinoid tumors? So about 20 to 30 percent of small bowel carcinoid tumors uh, our small bowel tumors are carcinoid tumors, and they usually occur in the distal ileum. Now, these are pretty common, and they're usually the most common cause of carcinoid syndrome, and that's only when they metastasize to the liver. So it's very usual for me to actually be referred to a patient that has a tumor uh, that's seen on a CT scan. It's usually the lymph node metastasis and not the primary tumor, and maybe a liver tumor and no one knows where the primary tumor is. So no one can figure out where is this tumor coming from. And almost always those tumors come from small tumors in the ileum. And uh, it's very common. And actually there are clues you can see on a CT scan. There's usually like desmoplasia, which means scarring, that leads to mesenteric ischemia and symptoms like of a bowel obstruction or pain after eating. And when we do resect these tumors, we usually do a prophylactic cholecystectomy or take out the gallbladder because, as we heard previously, octreotide, and we'll hear more of, becomes a central role in the treatment of these patients. So the patients present usually with a tumor that's actually in the mesentery, but the primary tumor is in the ileum. And so it's important to look for these primary tumors because they can be multifocal or multicentric. And here's a slide actually showing a patient who has what I was talking about, a tumor that you can actually see the lymph node metastases, and then you see the scarring and narrowing of the bowel, and that's where the primary tumor is. And here's another one with a tumor uh, in lymph node metastases and then narrowing of the bowel. So you, these are the most common, and this is a very severe one that's centrally located in the mesentery near the superior mesenteric artery and vein. And actually, we've been able to resect or remove these tumors along with the lymph nodes, but it requires careful planning because we don't want to leave the patient with a short bowel syndrome so that they have to take different medicines to, to be able to eat and to control diarrhea. And this is a pathology slide that shows you these ileal carcinoids. In other words, here's one we could probably feel when we palpated the small intestine but here's an adjacent one, and usually there's multiple tumors like this. 
And that's what's so tricky about it. You need to have a surgeon who knows that there can be multiple tumors and can resect them effectively. And then these tumors obviously stain for the somatostatin receptor, and that brown staining there shows all the beautiful staining for the somatostatin receptor, and it shows that these tumors will respond to octreotide therapy. So that brings us to the carcinoid syndrome, and the carcinoid syndrome, I think, is well, probably well known to the audience, but it's diarrhea, flushing, asthma, and severe symptoms, and it's usually related to liver metastases. So as I mentioned, these ileal carcinoid tumors commonly spread to the liver early, and they get also large retroperitoneal nodal metastases. So we need to get serotonin into the systemic circulation. And the diagnosis of this is measured by a 24-hour urine test for 5-hydroxyindole acetic acid. And if you have elevated levels of 5-hydroxyindole acetic acid, by definition, you have the carcinoid syndrome, and you're going to be a potentially carcinoid heart disease, which are, they're going to talk about. But I think from a surgeon's perspective, whenever we operate on these patients, if they have flushing, bronchospasm, that type of thing. If they undergo anesthesia, they can have the carcinoid crisis, which is a life-threatening problem. So it's absolutely critical to preoperatively medicate these patients with octreotide to inhibit that. And a lot of the anesthesiologists don't realize this. So on induction of anesthesia or before induction of anesthesia, you should give octreotide either sub-Q or IV to eliminate this carcinoid crisis because this is a potentially life-threatening problem if you operate someone with the carcinoid syndrome. Well, as I mentioned, carcinoid tumors can also occur in the rectum, and they usually are found on proctoscopy or colonoscopy. And you can see that one in every 2,500 uh, proctoscopies, you can see a small carcinoid tumor. And these are usually happen in the mid-rectum, they don't all behave in an indolent fashion, but most of them actually do. And as Dr. Uh, Longacre mentioned, we use different things to determine whether they're malignant. And probably the greatest thing is the uh, mitotic rate, which you can do with KI-67 or just by plain uh, histology. And if they have a high mitotic rate, we worry more about those tumors. And if they invade uh, into the lymphovascular areas, we also worry more. And bigger tumors have a poor prognosis. So these tumors, if they're small, less than two centimeters, if they have a low mitotic rate, just local resection is fine. But if they have a higher mitotic rate and they're bigger, then a standard like colon cancer operation is indicated. And another unusual type of carcinoid that's common that is often very confusing is gastric carcinoid. And gastric carcinoids, the great majority, if we look at gastric carcinoids, they're staged as type 1, type 2, and type 3. Eighty percent are type 1. And we get patients referred all the time with type 1 gastric carcinoids. And these patients, the most common cause of type 1 gastric carcinoids is pernicious anemia. So these patients have atrophic gastritis, and they don't make acid normally. So their gastrin level is elevated, and it gets confused with Zollinger-Ellison syndrome. So the diagnosis of Zollinger-Ellison syndrome, we need to have an elevated gastrin level and an elevated acid. So if you have a decreased acid and an elevated gastrin, then you get these little tumors which are spread throughout the stomach, and the endoscopist picks those up, and it's a big concern that these are malignant. These tumors are usually not malignant, and they don't really need surgery. They just need repeat endoscopy and careful follow-up. And uh, basically, if they get to be greater than two centimeters in size, we would consider surgery. But if they're less than two centimeters in size, they're relatively benign. Their metastatic potential is very low. And there's other gastric carcinoids, and again, size becomes an important criteria between the two. There's a type 2 gastric carcinoid, which has been seen in Zollinger-Ellison syndrome patients in MEN1 who have elevated gastrin levels. 
And those tumors actually can metastasize, but only about 12% of the time. The type 3 gastric carcinoids, they're usually big. So if the tumors are greater than 2 centimeters in size in the stomach, they're type 3 gastric carcinoids, and we would remove those surgically. So it's important to understand these tumors because some of these tumors are very indolent, like the appendiceal carcinoids and the type 1 gastric carcinoids and the small rectal carcinoids. They can just be relatively simple operations, not really radical operations, and the patients will do very well. And this is an unusual one. This is a type 1 uh, gastric carcinoid, but the patient developed a focus of adenocarcinoma. So that was a more unusual thing. But it, it underlies the importance of repeat endoscopy, say on a yearly basis, to keep an eye on these tumors. And this is a patient with type 2 gastric carcinoids whom we reported. This patient has a very giant stomach, and you can see it's filled, filled with these carcinoid tumors. And then on endoscopy, there's many, many carcinoid tumors. This is a patient with MEN1 who had zollinger ellison syndrome. And of course, with zollinger ellison syndrome, you get hypergastronemia, elevated gastrin levels, which is a stimulation for these gastric carcinoids. And this one required gastrectomy, but that's pretty unusual. And that's the uh, specimen. You can see all the tumors, many, many tumors in the stomach. And this one large tumor here did metastasize to lymph nodes. And then finally, we're going to talk a little bit about duodenal carcinoids. And they're pretty indolent as well, although they can also be malignant. So KI-67 is an important uh, parameter in whether they have lymph node metastases. So the great majority of these tumors you can see are less than 2 centimeters in size. They originate in the submucosa, and they can just be treated with local excision. But if they get to be larger and they spread to lymph nodes or if they invade into the pancreas, then they require uh, resection. So in summary, uh, for GI neuroendocrine tumors or carcinoid tumors, for gastric carcinoids, it's important to measure the gastrin level because if the gastrin level is elevated and they're type 1 gastric carcinoids and they're small, less than 2 centimeters, they only need repeat endoscopy by a good endoscopist who's actually done it before and should do it serially to be sure that the tumor doesn't grow in size. If they're large, uh, or the gastrin levels are normal, then they may require a formal resection. And for appendiceal carcinoids, the two centimeter rule is very important because most of these tumors are also relatively uh, good prognosis and they don't really need more than an appendectomy. This also, the two centimeter rule also applies to duodenal and rectal tumors. Small bowel tumors, as I mentioned, ileal carcinoids, are more aggressive. So even when they're small, they can metastasize to distant sites. And in patients with a carcinoid syndrome or bulky metastatic disease, it's critical to give prophylactic octreotide anytime you're going to do surgery because the carcinoid crisis can be life-threatening. And it's been reported that, you know, these patients may die if they're not prepared. This is any type of surgery, even, for example, dental surgery or anything like that. Okay, thank you very much. To, um, to carcinoid tumors, but there are probably a lot of uh, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor patients in the audience as well. So if for any of these questions you want to maybe differentiate for the, the two types of tumors, Yeah, I actually, I actually, my original talk was totally on pancreatic neuroendocrine <laughs> tumors. But the problem was I got confused because it said GI neuroendocrine tumors, so I wanted to cover the topic they gave me. But what questions do you have? So for, for any neuroendocrine tumor patients, what is, what is the goal of surgery, and how do you determine when to take out the primary tumor and when, when to not? Well, I think that's a, that's a good question. Uh, it's a complex question, unfortunately, because, well, for example, if you have liver, if you have an ileal carcinoid, and I think that's what you're referring to more than a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor, um, those patients, you know, if you look at the carcinoid crisis, 
I mean, the Karstlein conference that they had in Berlin that was relevant to that, they recommended to always take out the primary tumor. So for ileal carcinoid tumors, the problem is the primary tumors cause symptoms. They can cause, they get desmoplasia, so constriction, they get diarrhea, they get crampy abdominal pain, uh, and they have difficulty eating. So in those tumors, we always want to take out the primary, even in the presence of liver metastases. For neuroendocrine tumors in the pancreas, one group I could think of, you know, if they're in the tail of the pancreas, they can actually cause splenic vein occlusion, and then they get gastric varices. So I've had patients present with life-threatening bleeds, I mean, 50-unit bleeds from uh, neuroendocrine tumors in the tail of the pancreas. So, and that's another reason, you know, that you might consider taking out those tumors in the presence of distant metastases. So I think it's... I think you have to individualize all these cases and use your judgment to try to develop a good plan working with the oncologists and also the, the radiologists to see what can be done and what should be done. I mean, I think that it's not a definite hard rule that we always do a certain thing. We'll probably have some discussion of that in the panel session, too. And, and so one other question is, for patients that have a suspected tumor in, in any of the GI tract, when would you recommend an exploratory surgery? Yeah, so I think nowadays, I think the idea of an exploratory surgery is less and less frequent. That's what I'm trying to see. I see patients like that all the time that have maybe liver mets and no one knows where the primary is. But those patients almost always have an ileal primary. So... So I don't consider it exploratory surgery. Our TRIA scan is so good that it can image small tumors. In other words, we, our imaging has gotten better and better. So a long time ago, like I've been doing this through my talk that I was going to give, I've been doing this for 30 years. So in a 30-year time period, we couldn't find these tumors. Now we can find almost every tumor. So I don't think it's exploratory imaging. We, we have to recognize the patterns, and we can figure out what we're dealing with. That's what I really believe. Okay, thank you. Thank you.